Bam, live action. Good morning, everyone. For this gentle, delicate live show here on a Friday morning, we're starting an hour early. We're going to pour tea to begin. Hopefully you can hear that sound. I don't know if my microphone cancels that out. I'm hoping it doesn't. That'd be disappointing. I'm not sure how the noise cancellation works because it'll pick up things like my stomach growling, but not me doing anything percussion wise, like with an actual instrument. So I'm not sure what the, the system is for that. I really don't know. I'm, I've made the daring decision to go live an hour early because at 11 PST today, I'm, um, I'm live with a couple friends of mine and colleagues. We could say friends and colleagues, uh, Rodney Miller and Lisa Pachance, who um, are kind of like, I guess you could call them contemporaries. They both I graduated, know. quiet you, they both graduated from accomplishment coaching around the same time I did and are now kind of living a living the coach dream. And Lisa has, hello Grimby, come on in and I'll just use this cane to close the door. That's the technique I've established with my dog. Um, <clears throat> Lisa has a community that I'm going to find for you right now so that you can join us. Coaches, creating community, open a new tab, boom, go to the groups, and I post it here in the comments. Does it let me post the comments? Yes, it does. Boom, there's that group, Coaches Creating Community. So at 11 o'clock, myself, Lisa, Rodney are going to be having good morning, Andrew, and Grimby says good morning to you. We're going to be doing um, kind of a round table, maybe a bit of Q&A on um, learning how to like create clients in a way that's not sales focused. So creating clients through relationship, um, which is the thing that is just missed all the time in the coaching community. Oh, cool. Hey, Dave. Dave just registered for the Zoom. I agree. It is going to rock. It's going to be fun. Guaranteed fun. We're going to start today by pulling a tarot card. I think these are actually called oracle cards because they don't they don't follow the standard arcana of tarot, which is to say like tarot has, or tarot, as I've heard it pronounced, has uh, like four main suits. And then there's sort of like the major arcana and the, and the minor arcana. So you've got like four suits and you've also got these like greater cards that have specific, um, I don't know, meaning in a tarot deck. I'm not a... a tarot guy or a tarot dude or whatever the appropriate a warlock would that be it it's not really my vibe and i'll tell you why um first of all well let me show you these cards first we'll pull the cards and then i'll talk about my relationship to this so these are the way they look on the back and what i love is they gilded them black around the edges so that's a nice like you know copper this is just the back of the cards they all look like that um so we'll pull a card here let's see what we get Rip. Here's the card. We got, ooh, the revolutionary. Doesn't that look pretty? So it's a picture of, it looks like a kind of hand with long nails holding a torch. Ooh, that is oh, oh, revolutionary. And let's read in this Oracle Dex book. A lot of these would be cool tattoos. This book has on the cover a hand holding a dagger with some barbed wire around it. That's bad dagger design. Let's just look up what the revolutionary tells us. And then I'll start talking about um, my relationship to this. 106, it is of the ether. So this Oracle deck doesn't have specific tarot suits and arcana and stuff, but it does have kind of um, elements. So it's got a bunch of cards from earth, fire, water, air, and ether. Yeah, um, I'll tell you in a second, Andrew. I'm not sure where these are from. I believe Bay got them. I'll show you the cover. They're called Threads of Fate. Oracle, and then they're the rose edition because they have kind of a rose gold or a copper cover. Threads of fate. So Bay just gave them to me as a gift. So let's read what the revolutionary tells us. The revolutionary card is asking you to challenge the status quo. Whether it is external or internal, the revolutionary seeks to do things radically different. Radical. Like the outlaw, the revolutionary has ideals that can be viewed as quote unquote out there. They are a natural leader that can see what the collective needs and are able to put it into action. They invite others to be part of building the world with them. The revolutionary, I'm going to read two more paragraphs, not all of this. The revolutionary invites us to bring some of the trailblazing energy and apply it to our situation in life. 
How can you meet the needs of the collective? How can you lead with integrity? Hey, Tara. Be aware that working with revolutionary energy does not always translate to being accepted and loved. Nah, what? Get out of here, tarot oracle cards. You have people that support you, but your work can also attract naysayers. This just means it is potent and worthwhile. Do not let anyone affect how you stand in the world. <clears throat> Allow their words to fuel your fire and keep going. So, for all of us here, this is the card we got, the revolutionary do with that as you like. What I like to do is I set these cards over here on the side and I take, I sort of angle them in the box and I put this book behind them, make a nice little pillow. And then I take this card that I've drawn and I slide it in here at the top and then I put it over here and I forget about it. That's not entirely intentional. It's just how this stuff sort of works for me. So <laughs> yeah, Terry, you are in the right place at the exact right moment. Welcome. <clears throat> um, the thing first I want to say like part of what is missing I guess is the word for me with regards to these cards is that like I see them and I'm like this is badass interestingly versatility is a marijuana leaf I'm like oh cool look I got the alchemist what does that what does that do in the world like how do I make use of that or ooh this card says destruction. That's cool. I want to cast that spell, but I can't because these cards are more like oracular in nature. At least that's how they're designed, how they're invited to be used. So I can't do anything with them beyond pulling a card. And so what I like are magic, the gathering cards, because I can do shit with these cards. When I'm sitting down with my friends and playing, I'm like, buddy, I'm going to play this speaker of the heavens and I'm going to hammer you in the forehead with them. And you're going to be eating a bunch of four, four angels coming at you with flying every single turn from here forward. How do you like them apples? So it's more fun to me. And with Oracle cards, tarot cards, I'm always like, man, this is so cool. I really want to like, how do I play a game with them? And there, there isn't much and you can play some games, but they're just not, they're not the game I want to be playing. That's not really a criticism of them. It's more an acknowledgement. That's just what kind of excites me. The other thing I'll say about Oracle, Tarot, pulling cards, horoscopes, is that, uh, hey, Cammy, <laughs> is that um, what I think these things do, this is my belief. This doesn't have to be your belief. doesn't have to be your context. Some people have a belief or a context around these kind of cards, which is that they tell you the future. What I find these things do is they help us see what is inside. And the way they do that is they give us like a kind of a, um, we could think of like an easel or like a setting in which to kind of like, oh, I drew the revolutionary and what is that making me think of? What's well, making me think of like what's happening in my coaching practice right now? Or it's making me think of that book that I've been working on and oh, and so just like you could really do the same thing with anything. You could open your desk drawer and you could be like, ah, I pulled out the Ethernet cable with the dongle. What does the Ethernet cable with the dongle represent? And what does that mean? And, and it's not to diminish these cards. There's something to be said for beauty. Just the same reason I've talked in the past about beautiful stones and minerals and rocks. But for me, um, what they do is they help their value is in what they get out of us rather than what we get out of them. So that's where I kind of land on those. Anyhow, the revolutionary, that doesn't have to be your story. You could be like, that card was pulled just for me and it's time for me to set fire to my underwear or what, I don't know what, whatever your version of a revolutionary is. Andrew's got the brilliant idea that I'm going to charge him with um, running up the flagpole for me. He says, this could be a great marketing initiative are you finding yourself, we have to have our marketing voice, are you finding yourself not resonating with these oracle cards? Then check out who do you think you are for the real truth. In a world where only outlaws use marketing materials, I, I've talked to myself, I can't go further in this improv, can I? In a world where only outlaws use marketing materials, the marketers are the real outlaws. The revolutionary card. I don't know. Pull the parachute. Let's get out of this, this place that I've brought us. 
Okay, well, we drew we drew a tarot card. That worked pretty good. I've got props today in addition to those tarot cards. I've got, like, look at this right here. I'm going to be using this to talk about something. That's a set of scales. So just you wait. Ooh, and Tara and Andrew just came up with a really sweet idea, which is like an essence deck, which I really like. Like, Grimby wants to get out. You'll let him out here. Could have a, a deck of cards, like 25 qualities of being, and maybe the 50 shadows that come with those quality of beings. And <laughs> Andy, you're right. Andy's saying, I think the dog wants to go out. You're right on the money, Andy. Right on the money. Uh, okay. So we've talked about some bullshit. It was fun. We enjoyed it. Now what are we going to talk about? Uh, what is my my list of topics here that I've got? Putting things on the scales, learning to love the fall. They sound good. Strategy versus something to notice in the moment. Pretty good. Everyone is always doing good and probably some other stuff. I got I to gotta think about some other stuff. Oh, I think I'll talk about like the next book I'm going to write first. So who do you think you are is out there in the world? That's done, dusted. Maybe there's some marketing for it. Not so sure. Maybe. I need to talk to my guy about that to figure out like what happens next. Do I do a bunch of podcasts or stuff like that? And uh, does that interest me to do that? My room feels, somehow my room feels darker today. Let's brighten up the monitor. Maybe it's just the fact that it's dark outside. So there's like a couple ways I'm noticing I'm drawn in terms of writing. The first thing is that I've not had a writing practice for a while. As I've been editing and then working on marketing, that's been the priority. I've set aside daily writing as a practice to put attention into the book to bring it forward. So I'm feeling a bit of a call in that direction just to start to, I've got a lot of ideas that are percolating that I'd like to like capture into written word. Um, that's as much for me as anything. It's not sort of like, I want to do that because it helps me market myself, or I want to do that because people need to get it. It's more like, oh, I really like the, I like the moving stuff from my thought into words. The act of distinguishing stuff into concrete words really supports me, helps me move my own work forward. So there's that. And then second to that, I'm noticing like there's a couple book ideas that are there. The first one, which I don't think is really the path forward at this point now, was a book I was working on. I wrote about 35,000 words for it, which is a lot. And let's look, how, how, how a lot is that? How many words is a standard business book? Let's see, 50,000, 50 to 60,000. So it's like maybe two thirds ish of a book there. And that was um, all basically a business parable. Oh, and he's on it, 55K. Split the difference right between. And so the idea for this book started because I read uh, Get a Grip and um, there was some other book, or maybe it was called Traction. No, I think it was called Get a Grip, which is like a book written as a parable, a business parable. So you read this book and it's got a narrative that you follow instead of it just being expository, telling you like, do this. These are the things you need to understand. Blah, blah, blah. It's framed in a story. And I really liked that. I did not care for Get a Grip. I thought that the way in which people took on their work was very simplistic and trite, much like most sitcoms and movies. That's just how I experienced like what happened in these books. So for example, there was one guy in the story who was chronically late and this business entrepreneur guru, you know, gets hired and he comes on board and he, he says to the guy at one point, like the guy comes in late for the meeting again. Oh my God. And he writes, uh, what's, what does he write? And you might remember uh, Mike Ditka, I think, or some football person. He's like, here we follow Mike Ditka's rule. If you're not early, you're late. And the guy's like, oh yeah, sorry. And then like in the next chapter, the dude's completely cured his chronic lateness, which is fucking bullshit is what that is. That's that sort of supposes that the only reason we are late is because someone hasn't spoken about it as though like internally, this person doesn't have an ongoing fuck me. I'm late again kind of story. And so that sort of stuff fires as a good motivation for me. I was like, 
what the fuck? As I was reading, I enjoyed the fact that it was a parable. It sounds like it landed that way for you too, Andy. Like it's very simplistic. It's Andy's exactly right. Like um, very simplistic. And it, it continues to further this idea that we operate with, um, you know, in terms of our own mind societally that like, oh, the only problem is I just don't have the answer or like, I just need to do the thing. That's what we believe is lacking for transformation is like, I guess I haven't needed to do the thing hard enough. And maybe if someone quotes Mike Ditka to me, that will solve it. And the trouble with books like that is that it, it does two things. It gives us this false hope. It also has us not really pay much attention or reverence to what's really going on. Like we kind of relate to ourselves as this simple automaton. Oh, you just need to yell at yourself louder or like quote a famous football player or something. That's the thing. And third, it leads to disillusionment because we read that book and we're like, yeah, I should be on time. And then we try to be on time. And what do you know? It doesn't happen. And then we're like, man, there must be something really fundamentally wrong with me because I can't seem to, you know, do this thing. And what Andy said here is also really valid. Like it also gives people this, like this angle towards control. Oh, the problem is I'm just not controlling myself enough. I need to like Maybe if I hammer my forehead more with a story about being late. What's missing in all of that is like the deeper exploration of like, what is it that has this person be late? And what do they make? What's their relationship to time? And what's going on underneath that? And these books step all over that. And consequently, we don't have much in the way of models for real transformation. Transformation that's that, that like really makes a difference and that invites us to like deep reverence with everything that's showing up for us, including our tardiness. So that got me like amped. It's like, fuck you, get a grip. I'll show you. I'll write 35,000 words, <laughs> which I did about like real transformation. And the whole idea of this story was someone named Jonathan, a coach named Jonathan, who's really transformational being brought into an organization trouble with that book is it got as far as it did and then it became a slog and I noticed people as I was sharing stuff were not really jiving with it they, they were so there's like a few people that kind of liked it but um it didn't really seem to have much resonance with them and because it wasn't that interesting to me eh, that's a strong sort of thing to point towards for me you know when I notice I'm not stoked about it and other people aren't stoked about it what are we doing this for so that kind of set aside Andy, can you share the title of your new book? I would love to, I really love, I've got one of Andy's books. I'm gonna pull off the shelf here. Bah, 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 bah. I love Andy's work and, oh, look at that, I've made a mess. Your book did that, Andy. Um, and this is one of Andy's books, The Last Letter. I met Andy when, look at this handsome bastard on the back there. I met Andy when um, he was, I think he were touring and he was in San Francisco at the time. And I immediately was like, this guy's a goofball and brilliant and I love him. Hey, Katie. And, um, and at the time he was touring, he, he was writing this letter uh, about the last letter that he wrote to his mom. I think that's right, Andy. So anyhow, if you've not read this or any of his work, you should check him out. Andy has beautiful things to say. He's a really meaningful, potent writer and I love his work. And it sounds like the next book is the Connection Playbook. Awesome. Katie, I'm loving the content you're putting out there. I, I have to say, Katie, I am um, astounded at the amount of content you put out. I don't know how many hours a day you're working, but you are prolific, girl. If you don't follow Katie's content, you should. And there's plenty of it. She's got a lot out there and all of it's great. I love the I love the boldness and the um, the truth. There's Katie is a woman with just a tremendous amount of integrity. There's a lot of value there. Anyhow. Back to these books. So that book's kind of fallen away for now. Maybe it comes back. Maybe there's a new iteration. I don't know. The two places that I'm kind of drawn to are one, a book that, good morning, Bob. Bob, I want to hear about your uh, retreat coming up. Please share something about it with us in the, in the um, comments. I don't have any of the books I was going to bring over here to show you. But I used to have a bunch of books on this shelf and they were like co-active coaching and coach anyone about anything. And these books are terribly dry and terribly boring. And 
very formulaic and there's a real lack of like relationship building or ontological work, like the being of you in this. And so I imagine a lot of people read these books and what happens is they read the book and they synthesize the information in the book and then they parrot it, they ape it. It comes back out, you know, I did the thing, I'm doing the thing, I'm doing it right. I've checked in with the client three more times. Great, I asked them this question. I'm doing it all right. And why is it so boring? And why is the client not really moving forward? And why are we both nodding our head like, this is good, what's going on? And so I can see there's like an opportunity to write a book on coaching that actually invites and causes transformation for people. The act of reading the book actually generates some transformation for them so they can start to like deepen into that. So that's one of the things that I'm kind of keen on, drawn towards. I like that idea for a book because that is something that would benefit coaches and leaders, which is where I'm kind of geared towards. <laughs> Tara's saying, oh, the old accomplishment coaching MOPA list. Yes, the books that we have read. And then um, the other one that I'm keen on is this idea of like supporting people, coaches primarily with enrollment and client creation because it, there's so much um, misunderstanding in the field. And you've probably heard me, if you've ever been on this show before, you've heard me talk about this at length. And it's just, it's real tragedy because what happens is you get a lot of people missing out on the opportunity, the possibility, the transformation, the abundance. And so I'd like to write a book kind of, it might be something along the lines of like a spiritual successor to the prosperous coach or sort of like widen what Rich, and, Rich Littman and Steve Chandler kind of that they created something really beautiful and began to open up a process, but there's more that can be elaborated on, a deeper cut, a deeper swing into that. So those are kind of the next books that are swirling around, but I feel like right now what there is to do is to re-engage with a writing practice and then see what comes forward. Uh, I wanna share what you wrote here, Bob, but first, Andrew saying, I enjoyed these books, those books. He enjoyed coactive coaching, coach anyone about anything. I think there's value in them by understanding the concepts within as opposed to take them as a single source of truth or direction. Aho. I totally agree, Andrew. We need some of those dry books. Maybe dry is not even a fair term for them, but we need procedural books. It's it's important to um, to allow ourselves to get some scaffolding. That's really important. And a lot of, and yeah, I like the way you put it initially, write and see. Do what's right and see what shows up. See what book is being written. Um, and then Bob sharing about the Alchemy of Men retreat, 14 men coming and there's room for two more. When is the date for that, Bob? If, if anyone here knows anyone that's looking for like a really transformational experience specific to men, I recommend you put them in touch with Bob or even just check out the content that Bob's putting out because he's doing some awesome stuff. I love the works. Uh, sorry, the work that you and Alex are, are putting together. 1027, so about a week. So you're looking for like two adventurous men at this point. Cool, I'm excited for you. Okay, let's talk about um, putting things on the scale. Look, I brought a scale. This is a gift from my mom because I told her I want a set of weights and measures. So she found this at an antique store. It's not quite what I was looking for, but it's still pretty cool. So this is a jeweler's uh, set of scales. You, you like close this up and it all folds down. And I guess a jeweler would take this with them to see a client or something. And they've got a quick set of scales they can measure, you know, how much does this rare rock over here weigh? And the answer is, what, is, what does this look like? It's about meh, 35 grams. It says about 35 grams. So we got a set of scales here. What I notice fundamentally happens in our lives, Antique Roadshow. Yes, yeah, right, you can take it to Antique, I should, I should bring that. She keeps finding me cool gems. So what happens in our lives as humans is we, 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 at any point in our life, we have a frame for what's possible in our lives and we can't, uh, <laughs> Bob Conlon is saying that his old drug dealer had this, this right here. Who knows? Maybe my mom got this from her Coke dealer. I, I don't actually know. I mean, I can't imagine my mom doing a bunch of blow, but now that you've put that in my head, Bob and Cammy. So we have a frame in our world and the frame is like this 
this live frame where I can't see anything outside of it. I'm not conscious to the world outside of that frame. And anytime someone asks me, hold on, let me take a step back. Inside that frame is a an entire almost infinite list of what is and is not possible. Hey, Andy, second Andy, we got two Andys here and an Andrew. It's a very uh, Andy, Andrew heavy uh, live and I'm loving it and it's fucking great. So we have a frame and in that frame is an infinite range of like po of what is and is not possible to us. And what's possible is a whole bunch of stuff and when you as coach or leader go to someone and say, you know, what do you want? What do you want that's really like amazing or, you know, what would you love that's impossible? What we're often met with is people saying stuff like, oh, I don't believe anything's impossible. Great. So that's where most people start. And in the realm of transformation, transformation works by supporting us to create a result that's impossible, to create a result that is outside of what's predictable for us. And our frame tells us what's predictable, what's allowed, and what's not. When someone says, I don't believe anything is possible, what they're almost certainly really saying is something along the lines of like, given enough time, anything is possible. Or given enough money, anything is possible. So they're creating like this contingent possibility. They're actually saying something along the lines of like, I don't believe anything is physically impossible. Great, but what about in terms of results you'd like to create? And if we start to dig into that, what you'll start to discover is that people say things like, well, look, I'd love to do this with my job. I could do this with my job. It's possible for me to have this experience with my job, make more money, make less money, work more hours, work less hours, whatever it happens to be. But I don't want to give up on this. So this is where the scales come in. This is where this handy prop, so glad I brought this prop, is that they've got two aspects of their lives up on these scales. I can have, I could have this rock be twice as heavy as normal, but then I would have to be willing to like, let this be less present in my life. Or I could have more. I could put this heavier weight here on this scale. Wham. But then I'd have to be willing to give up less of this. I'd have less freedom, I'd have less money, I'd have less whatever it happens to be. Oh, Andy, I agree with you 100%. And I think we can still be at cause. So there's a ton of luck involved in everything we have. And we can we can what we can choose and, and step into is who we're being about the life and about the luck and all of that sort of stuff. So what starts to happen is that we we end up with this notion of possibility where it's like anything's possible as long as I'm willing to adjust the scales, as long as I'm willing to, I could make as much money as I want, but I'd have to give up on blah, 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 blah. This is all a function of our frame. Our frame tells us, it tells you, it's possible in your life to do this or to do this, but not both. You can have all the chocolate or you can have all the vanilla ice cream, but you can't have all of all of the ice cream or something that is a better example, a better metaphor here. And so what happens when you as a coach or someone trying to support some of the transformation come and say, what would you like that's impossible to you? You often end up meeting people on the scales and they say, well, look, like I could ask for that, but I know that that would require, it's not that it's impossible, Adam, it's just that I'm not willing to make the sacrifice to have it. And as soon as you start to hear those words, what's actually being told to you is whatever is on either side of this scale, that's the place that that's the thing that is really impossible for them is to have both of those things in full. And so what humans do is we go into our lives and we're like, okay, I can, I can have a bunch of money and esteem and repute, or I can have quality of living. I can have like, a good life or something like that. I can have family time, quality time with my family, but I can't have both. And so I have to find like, where do I balance the scale? And so that becomes the human condition. That's the game that we're all playing is like, okay, how much money do I want to make given that there's a necessary trade-off between the two? 
And so what you see in the world are people playing out various, how would we call this? Like iterations of their scale, various solutions to this problem. You could think of this very much like in math. In math and with calculus, you're talking about like, what's a solution for the equation? And then you kind of like create mins and maxes. So the way that looks is that some people will be like, okay, fuck it. I don't, what matters to me more than anything is quality time with my family. I'm going to be okay not making much money. Let's assume that it's money and family time that people have on the scale. So for those people, they figure out how to create a beautiful life that doesn't involve requiring any money. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. But it comes at the sacrifice. So there's some things they just become okay with never having. I'm okay with having only this much money or not being able to do these sort of things or, you know, whatever it happens to be. For other people, they're like, uh, I really want money. I really like what money allows. It lets me do good things. And so for those people, what they do is they flip the scales. They go the other way. I'm going to go hardcore for 20 years down this path. I'm going to make a lot of money and I know that it's going to cause this as my sacrifice. And then I'm going to retire at 50. Vroop. I'm going to flip the scales. Notice that that strategy still has them on the scales. It's the best way they can figure out to kind of get 100% of the money they want and 100% of the quality time they want. But it's not actually 100% and 100% because for the first 20 years of their life, they've got none of the family time, the quality time, the balance, the whatever. And then for the second half of their life, they're giving up all of their ambition, all of the part of them that loves that drive, that going after something, that shark kind of quality in service of the quality time. And so what's really happening is they're creating this compromise, the 50-50. The 50-50 compromise can be done over time where you spend the first 20 years of your life grinding and then the next 20 years of your life doing nothing. Or it can happen right now. It can happen throughout your life, which is often what happens when people try, try to kind of angle themselves towards like a government job, at least here. Here in Canada, the government job is like stability, pretty good pay, but probably not a lot of agility. And you know you're not going to like, you're probably not going to make a ton of money or get like a lot of the repute that you might want. This is not a statement about the government. It's more about how people hold the government, the context they're using, and how it fits into this notion of the scales. So, nothing wrong with any of this. Not meant to do something different. But when we are people standing for transformation and possibility, our job is to stand for the possibility that someone can have it all. And all of these solutions that they've created are really just different variations. See, Andy, nice to have you with us. <clears throat> there are different ways of balancing this equation out. How do I figure out, given that these two things are at odds with each other, what is the, the solution to this that is most optimal for me, that I feel the best about, that I'm willing to live with? Our job as purveyors of transformation is fuck the scales. Yo, why are you putting these two things on the scales? Who said that they have to be at odds with each other? Now, there's very good reasons. This person's created some, you know, some version of their life where that's the, that's the truth of it. I really am curious. Sorry, I keep getting distracted by my lighting. It's very weird right now. It's the stormy quality. I want some thunder to come in through my windows so I can laugh maniacally. <clears throat> so our job as a leader, as a coach, anyone that's involved in any kind of transformation is to get really curious about why are those two things at odds with each other? How has this person created that as a truth for them? And they've got a whole bunch of reasons why. No doubt, wherever we find ourselves in our lives makes sense. We arrived there with good sense, good intention. It was well-reasoned. So it's not just a random thing. It's not because I guess that's the way I am. There were stories we were taught, things that we were told, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we want to get, get curious about, though, is like that underlying story that had people put this stuff, these two things in their life on the scales in the first place. Because if you can break up that story that has these things be on the scales, if you can remove these from the person's life, then you can start to like, OK, well, why don't we just take this off? And what if we just took this and this? OK, great. So how do we create this where we get to have it all, where we can have this beautiful rock Plus these sweet, sweet weights that are, I don't know, worth money, we'll say, for the purpose of this conversation. That's what we're always doing in a conversation 
in service of transformation. We're helping people see where they've created a, what we call a context, a story, a frame that has two things at odds with each other, in tension with one another. And we're helping them kind of let go of that, that construct, that tension that these two things have to be at odds with each other. If you can break that story up, then people can start to create the opportunity to have both. I want to make a bunch of money and work very little. I want to make a bunch of, I want the amount of money I make to increase the more quality time I spend with my children. To be clear, that's not the predominant story in society. But just because all the fish are swimming in one direction doesn't mean that there isn't a better direction to go or a better direction for you. There might be a better direction available for you, regardless of where society is angling towards. So this isn't to say that there's not tons of evidence societally to back up that belief that these two things have to be on the scale. But just because there's a bunch of society's beliefs, a bunch of evidence to support this, it doesn't mean you have to be stuck in that. So if you're a coach, if you're a leader, if you're working in this transformational realm, that's the place you want to start to listen for with people is what have they put on the scales? When they say anything is possible, sure. And what's on the scale against this thing? Sure, I could have blah, 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 blah. But whenever you hear that but, you want your ears to perk up and your eyes to shine with dollar signs. Not really. It's just kind of a funny image. But when you hear that, I could have this, but that's where we get really curious. Oh, cool. Here is the story that is dictating what is and is not possible for this person in their life. That's what I want to look with. That's what I want to explore with people, assuming they want to. Okay. Well, I talked about the scales. I used that prop. Well done, me. Should probably talk about learning how to love falling off your bike. This is a story a bit. It starts with the forge. We've got some forgelings here. Andy, uh, Tara, Andrew. What up, dudes? Thanks for repping the forge. So um, four years ago, well, I sh let me see. How do I set this up? Um, the Forage is the program Bay and I run, if you've never heard of it. And it's in service of people that are committed to causing transformation in the world. And the only way we can support someone else's transformation is to walk through the same gate of our own transformation first. What that means is like, if I have a story that money is scarce and the strategy I create in my life to ensure that I don't have to deal with that fear is by making a ton of money, what it looks like on the surface is like I've overcome my fear of money running out. Look at all this money I have. I have a big money bin. I don't worry about money at all. Except, guess what? It's all I worry about. I'm constantly in fear of it. Even though I've amassed great amounts of wealth, all I can think about is how do I get more? I'm like clutching at money. Let me find, there's a magic card for this. Oh yeah, where is it? There it is. Give me the black border one. No, hold on. There it is. Perfect. Uh, view open image in new tab. And then we go here and then I copy this and I go here. Oh yeah, I'm subjecting y'all to Magic the Gathering. Boom. I wonder if I can just paste that image right into our chat. Will this work? Oh, it showed up there. Cool. So what I like about this image I've just shared is this guy has a whole pile of gold and then he's eyeing this one coin off to the side that he can't see. Ah, I need that one too. So under on the surface, people see that and they're like, oh man, look at Adam. He's amassed so much wealth. I need to figure out how to not worry about money the way he doesn't have to worry about money. And I want to turn around and teach that to people. But I'm actually not set free from money one bit. All I've done is change how it looks on the surface, but the underlying fear is the same. And our fear often polarizes in its expression. So that means that there's tends to be like two ways that our fear of something shows up. One, if like I'm afraid of, of money running out, then one way it shows up is not having enough money and it always running out. So like the truth of it. The other one is a little bit like you could think of it kind of like the the kid that's scared of the monster under the bed. So he boards up his bed and he never, ever looks at his bed. So that's the fear where we run as far and as fast away from our fear. That's the response, sorry. We run as far and as fast away from our fear as we can. So that expression is make a ton of money. 
And look, most of us would be like, surely, Adam, it's better to have a bunch of money than none at all. So what are you saying that both of these suck? What I'm saying is, yeah, it's nice to have money, but it's not really the money that you're looking for in this scenario. It's the peace. It's the ease. It's the like, ah, oh, I'm okay. I know I don't have to run out. I don't have to worry about running out of money. What you want in terms of your relationship with money, I would assert, is the same relationship you have with oxygen, which is you don't really have to think too much about it. You don't worry about it. You take a breath. You let a breath go. When your body needs another breath, you take another breath. So that's what we're striving towards. We like buying stuff. I'm not taking that away from us. But what I'm pointing to is that on the surface, this person that we've drawn out, who's amassed great amounts of wealth, they are every bit as much a slave to money as the person who seems to never have enough. In both situations, the fear of money running out guides what they do and how they show up in life. And if you don't believe me, just look at people like Donald Trump, right? Homie just can't stop being greedy and chasing after stuff. It's not because there's a deficiency in him. It's because he's got an underlying fear that has not been actually addressed. He has just layered on top of it strategies to try to run away from his fear. And consequently, those strategies twist us. We start to be a slave to the money. We do things that are kind of out of integrity with our truest self, our light, our essence. <clears throat> so there's no breakthrough yet for this person who's created a bunch of money. In order for them to support people to create breakthroughs around money, they need to come up against someone who's created a breakthrough around money and a fear of it running out and say, look at all the wealth I have. How's it going over there, per person? And the person who's created the breakthrough already says, huh, I notice you seem like money is really scarce. And the person laughs and scoffs at them. is like, look at your shitty suit and says things like, what are you talking about? Look how much money I have. I never think about money. And this person says, well, that's funny because there's nothing wrong with it. But I noticed like for the last two hours, all you've been talking to me about is money. Seems like it's really on your mind a lot. And this takes time for this person who thinks that they've overcome money once and for all. It takes time for them to come to an acceptance of this truth. That even though they are certain that they've solved this for themselves, actually, they're very much enslaved by it. And as they slowly sit with this coach, we'll say, who's walked through this themselves, they can start to learn to see how they are every bit as enslaved as that other person. And actually, all the money in the world only seems to increase their fear of it running out. And what that person, that coach, can support them to do is to come and sit with the fear that money might run out and to start to discover when it does, when money actually runs out, <clears throat> they're okay. The only way to really discover that for yourself is to allow it to happen. <clears throat> it's what we call a breakdown, incidentally. So where the hell am I in this point? Oh, yeah, I'm in the holy mackerel. I really took a digression. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. So the upshot, the point that I was making prior to like going down this huge storied path that you have generously followed me along is that for anyone that wants to be transformational, they have to walk through a path similar to the one I've just described, whether it's around money, around romance, around relationship, around good food, health, spirituality, whatever it is, that's the path of becoming transformational is that you take on your own transformation. The ego will always convince you, you've done your work, teach other people. Or the ego will do the opposite and say, you've never done your work, never ever engage with that. But don't worry about that one for now. So our ego's always actively saying like, no, no, you solved this, help other people out. And what that does, is it takes you away from looking at how you haven't solved it. it. It frees you up. You get to put your attention there on helping this poor soul. How generous I am. Oh, so kind of me as opposed to going inwards. So let's have a sip of tea. Let me reset. We're talking about the forge. One of the things that we're standing for in the forge is people's ability to invite people into a world of possibility. Remember I talked about taking things off the scales. So the reason someone would join us in the forge is because they want to lead or coach people in such a way that they, the people they are supporting can create lives where anything's possible. And based on what that long winded story I just shared with you, in order for them to do that, they're going to have to start to create possibility in their own lives. 
And we're at this beautiful place in the forage where people are really keen to do that. They're excited. They like this program. They're like, it's neat. I'm learning stuff. And now it's time for their feet to touch the fire. The way that looks, or at least one of the ways that looks, is that we say, hey, we're putting on a retreat. It's free for you to come. Why don't you come with us? Are you interested? And people immediately come into confrontation with the world they live in, in which it's not possible for them to come. It's not always related to the retreat, but everyone has some version of this. Oh, I really want to do this, but. And so the way that starts to show up is, oh, I would really like to come, but reason, 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 reason. Oh, this sounds super exciting. I'm really pumped for you guys. It's always very reasonable, but this isn't going to be for me. And this is like a really beautiful, profound place in transformational work and in supporting breakthroughs for a few reasons. The first is when someone says something like that, underneath it is a subtext. And the subtext is, I've made my decision, fuck off. And if it's not there yet, it comes very quickly as we start to poke. So what's happening is we as humans inadvertently defend this frame that I've just talked about. We're like, no, 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 no. I know that you say anything's possible, but I'm really clear here, blah, 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 blah. This is where I'm at. And our job in this crazy business of transformation is to start from the premise like, one, it's okay to do whatever you want. Two, if anything was possible, like if whatever the reason is, the reason being, let's say, um, I'm worried my wife will feel alone and I don't like leaving her feeling left out. So it's really important to me to like stay at home with my wife. And I'll like, you guys will be in my thoughts and prayers and blah, blah, blah. Noble, right? Hard for us to argue. And consequent to that, our default human reaction is to do what's called colluding with them in that. Wow, that's so cool that you're so like, caring about your wife. What a beautiful stand for you to take. I so get it. We're going to miss you, right? Love to have you there. Totally love where you stand for your partner. Thanks for letting us know. Off you go. That, that's the default human place. Sidebar. I just want to be clear. What I'm describing here is why transformation requires something really special and a deep body of work behind us to, for us to actually be able to support people to create it. So I'm, I'm laying out a story so you can start to see why this is so challenging. So they tell us that story. And then the human default reaction is like, man, you're so cool and noble and, you know, whatever. Good on you. Thank you for letting me know. We don't want to push back on that. We're like, that sounds so reasonable. But it's important to consider that sounds reasonable in a world where your wife where your choices are either you can go away to a retreat or you can ensure your wife doesn't feel left out. But if, if it was all possible, if it was possible to go to a retreat and have your wife feel completely held, in fact, more held than ever before, and like you cared more than ever before about her, well, then why are we settling for this? If that was possible, if it was possible to do that, to go away on this retreat and leave our partner feeling that way, then why would we be settling for that other thing? And so we can start to see, hopefully, as I'm describing this, oh, it's because I can't see that, that that's a possibility for this person, and nor can they. So we're buying into this, the collective story that either you can, the, the scales, right? We've both been like, yeah, totally. Go to the retreat on this side of the scale or make partner feel comfortable, accepted, not left alone like you care about them, you know, da 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 and so because we ourselves buy into that lack of possibility, we collude with the person. Totally. If those are your two choices, it makes sense you're choosing this one. Thank you for caring so much about your partner. And this hard thing as in this transformational profession is we got to stand outside of that. We have to stand for the possibility that it's all possible. And as we do that, it starts to occur to this person who said no, like we're not listening to them. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I really appreciate where you're coming from, but I want to be really clear. I've thought about this. I've considered all of the options, and this is just the best choice for me. This is where the fuck you is starting to come up, right? Or fuck off, right? It's a loving fuck off. It's the nicest fuck off you'll ever hear, but it's a fuck off all the same. 
I really appreciate where you're intending to support me. And I think that's a great place for you to look, but I'm really at peace with where I've chosen. So please don't ask me anymore, right? Can you hear that the, the really kind hearted fuck off in that? Really pat you on the head, fuck off over there, go support those other people. This is not a problem to be engaged at this level for anyone. But for people that have committed to supporting other people in the role, in the game, the experience of transformation, for people that are choosing to say, my work, my life is gonna be about supporting transformation in other people, either through my leadership or my coaching, pretty much the same thing, that's a problem. And so we have to do what's called standing for them. And standing for them is this really challenging energetic space that we as coaches and leaders have to hold for people. And the stand is, it's possible. And it doesn't mean you have to choose into it. But right now you've created it for yourself. You've got these two things on the scale and that's the problem. So we need to support you to see that it's possible to have all of it. And then once you can see that's possible, then your no is going to be so much more powerful because you're saying no, not from this is the best of the options I have. So I'll choose this one. You're saying no from a place of saying like, wow, I really could create it all and I'm still going to choose out. We call that putting people at choice in their lives and to put someone at choice means that we help them see all of the entirety. We help them see past the frame that they're caught into. Let me get, there we go. Past this frame so they can see the real set of choices that are available. And as you support people to do that more and more, more life becomes open for them. They become available to more of it. So that's the work we're doing in the forge right now. We're supporting people in the face of their resistance because Unbeknownst to ourselves, we can't see it, but we actually defend this frame. We fight for its existence. No, 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 no. I appreciate you're trying to help me see something else. I really need you to understand that like, there's no way this is possible any other, these are the options I have. We fight for it. We're unaware of it. That's our resistance. And so <clears throat> as we stand for people in this way, and as we support our leadership team to stand for people this way, stuff gets kicked up. Energy gets kicked up, people get frustrated, fuck off. People get annoyed by the conversation. And we have, you can hopefully hear, like as you're listening to this, maybe you notice like some resistance of your own showing up. Well, you should just take people, you should honor people for what they say. You should just let people tell you, if people tell you no, you should respect that and move on. Totally. We agree with that. We always check to make sure we have permission. But the place we're asking for permission is, hey, we think that there's something you can't yet see that we would like to help you see in service of the reason you're here. Are you interested in that? And usually people are yes to that. That's when we can do the work. Any resistance you notice showing up, that is a sign of where you've got some resistance in the face of standing for people this way. That is a sign, a measure of your own resistance to stepping into the transformational work that is available. This is the heart of transformation is our ability to stand for people this way, loving, letting them have whatever reaction they have, because we know resistance is tough. It's hard to set down and we can't see the boundaries of our frame. We can't see this frame. We're unaware of it in our own world, just like you can't see your blind spot. And that's what makes it tricky. What's tricky about your blind spot is that you can't see that you cannot see. It's not just that you can't see. If there's like this little black square that hovered right here that was like black, and I was like, oh, that's my blind spot. I see it. Okay, I just got to move my eyes so I can see here, and then I move over here. Okay, I can see. Great, I can work around my blind spot. But what's really challenging is I can't see that I can't see right here. My brain fills it in for me. So my blind spot is invisible to me. So I actually have resistance to the idea that I have a blind spot. I'm looking around. I don't see it. I don't see a place where I can't see. You're fucking crazy. I don't think this is my blind spot. That's how we are about our frames. Tara's saying that's so true. We inadvertently become warriors for our frames instead of our possibilities. And, and then she adds, or at least I do, but Tara, you're right on the money. That's absolutely what we all do. We become warriors. I love that term, warriors for our frames, for our limitations. And in one of my favorite books of all time, um, 
Illusions by Richard Bach, one of the quotes by the main character is, argue for your limitations, and sure enough, that is what you will get. The trap is we don't realize that that's what we're arguing for, even though it's so clear to everyone outside of us, because everyone outside of us can see this frame. You know, when I tell you, I, I don't know, I, 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 when I marketed for my book, I, I was certain no one would want to buy it, and so I was really like, shy about doing it and i was sure that people wouldn't be interested or you know sometimes i tell people yeah i like started this program and i was certain no one would show up and i'm really scared and they're like you're fucking stupid you got a big following people like you what are you talking about but that's my frame you know i've got a story about myself that i'm that people don't really want to come to my party i'm not that interesting they like patronize me you know they'll pat me on the head oh yeah let's give adam a view we'll show up to see what he has to say before we jump off but they're not really interested in what I'm putting into the world. That's my frame. And, and sure enough, I'll defend for that frame. And so it, part of our work is to work with people that can help us see when we are arguing for limitations. I'll give you one more example. A dear friend of mine, one of my best friends, is a very skilled developer and has a vision of, of moving into working for himself. And um, I'll ask sometimes, I'm very cautious about asking anything remotely coaching of my best friends. They've had more than enough of me in the early days. I was a mess, a mess in the sense like I was trying to coach everyone and everything without permission. And it was gross. So I'm very cautious these days. And, um, but I'll ask sometimes like, how do you want your work day to look when you, you know, once you've moved into like what you're doing next? And he's like, well, because of the nature of the industry and blah, 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 blah. You know, you kind of have to work 10 hour days. And I'm like, okay, but like, how do you want it? To, like, what do you want it to look like? Is that what you want? It's like, well, it's not so much about what I want. It's about like how I, hey, Leanne, nice to see you. It's about how it can be and what I need to do to get where I want to be and being okay with that. So just notice, right? There's nothing wrong with it, but that's an example of arguing for the limitation. Here's why it has to be that way. You don't understand, Adam. Here's why me going on this retreat would make my partner feel this way. You know, that's, that's us arguing for our limitations and it's totally innocent. We can't see it. So we need to work with people if we want transformation in our lives to be with people that can say, hey, I notice you're, that can stand outside of our frame and get supported in their own lives to see their own frame so that we're not overlaying our frame with our clients. <laughs> Cammy and Leanne both saying, oh boy, the early days of being a coach. Here's how my early days of being a coach were. Um, one, totally lacking in consent. What I mean by that, consent's a bit of a loaded term these days, but like I was just, people would show up and be like, oh, what a stressful day. And I'd be like, I would ask what now I would call a penetrative question, a question that like, sort of goes in deep. Oh, what, what is it about the way you're relating to your day that has you feeling like it's stressful? That's, that is way too much deepening of intimacy without any permission, without any like relationship created. It, it's akin, it's a, an analogous to like showing up on a date and someone being like, you look nice. And then me trying to French kiss them right out of the gate. Like, it's not as intrusive physically, but the energy of it is still like very stepping right over that line. So it took a lot of me learning that of, of getting told like fuck off or more often than not, when you do it that way, conversationally, you just get people closing. And then, and then what I would do in those early days is judge them for closing. Oh, they don't want to be intimate. I hate people that only like small talk. Yo, dude, it was you. <laughs> You're shutting people down and then they are giving you only what is available in that moment from the closure that you created, Adam. So it takes a lot to start to learn this. I have a great amount of empathy for coaches that are practicing in the early days. And God bless young Adam and you, if you're one of these coaches and the people that are doing this because we have to make the mistakes to learn how to do it differently. We have to learn to love to fall off the bike. And if we, if we instead try never to make mistakes, it's so much harder to grow. People trend out 
into one of two directions. One is uh, they censor themselves. I'm going to hold myself in check and only do what I'm certain is right. That's one way people try to learn. And then the other way is people are like, I got to do it right. And they try to take a bunch of action. I was more in that direction. And I really believe that's an easier direction to learn. It's bumpier because you're like, go, you're going too fast as opposed to going too slow, but at least you learn, right? At least you're leaning forward into something. And so I would make these mistakes and I'd bring it back to my coach and be like, oh, what do I, I need a new class of people to talk to. These people suck. My coach would be like, well, oh, hang on now. Let's hold on a second, Adam. Let's take a look at what's going on here and be like, wow, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, arrogance and, you know, stuff like that. That could only come up because I was taking those steps. I was leaning forward. And that does you so much better than when you're holding it all in check, trying really hard to learn it first before you take a step. You can't, you can't learn to walk, you can't learn to ride a bike, and you can't learn transformation through those approaches. Really, you can't learn much of anything through that approach. Sooner or later, you have to get into the world and get dirt on your hands. And the sooner we start to do that, the better. Thanks for that trip down memory lane, uh, Cami and Leanne. Here's one place that this is really common, and I'll see this a lot, is people's relationships to projects and to the doing of their lives. So this is also the point in our journey through the forage where our coaches are kind of in a bit of resistance to the idea of building a project or we've invited them to, to create some kind of tangible result they want and then build structure around it. And now they're like, ah, I don't really like it. And this happens for everyone. This is a, I would say, probably a necessary part of learning how to be a client, learning how to be supported in a transformational journey. And the way this kind of looks is that me or a coach or your leader stands for you to like make a declaration. I will do this. Here's the thing, the what, by this point, the when, the what by the when. And we have resistance to that as a human. Full stop, we have resistance to that. And the reason we have resistance to that is as soon as we say, I will do something by this date, it puts us on the hook, as Seth Godin says. Seth Godin invites you to put yourself on the hook. He says, you got to put yourself on the hook. Until you do, you're not called into anything. And that's so true. That's really what we're talking about here. So as soon as I say, I'm going to do this by this point, I, my resistance is because I know now there's a risk of me failing. As long as I have my, my declaration as like this vague thing, I'm going to create more connection in my life in the next year. I'm not on the hook for anything. It's nice and safe. How are you going to hold me accountable to that? You can't. And so I don't have to, I don't have to fear me failing. I don't have to fear falling off the bike and not doing it right. But what this does is it, is it means that people are never brought into confrontation with what is and isn't working. And one of the greatest gifts of a declaration is that it, it creates a point at which you have to kind of take stock of how things are going. What's happening? Is this working? When we don't have a milestone, is this working is answered from our feelings. How, how is your project going? You know, a project without milestones. Well, you know, I'm trying to like be kinder to people. And, and like this past week, I felt pretty good about that. Like I, I said, a nice thing to the lady in my building who I don't normally talk to. And like the janitor, I kind of smiled at as I walked by. So yeah, I think I'm doing pretty good. I would say the project's moving forward. Okay, great. And then the next week we could ask the same question. They're like, well, you know, I got really mad a few times in traffic. I was really pissed off at people. And like some people cut me off and I started swearing. So I don't know. Now I'm not so sure. Great. And you probably notice like that project, the person's progress look like that. Who knows where it's at? And it's totally dictated by their feelings. Whereas if the person has like some kind of tangible result that they've brought, whatever it is they want to create in their life to like the ground, you know, feet on the ground, what's going to actually be the result? I am having a party with 10 people. Have you invited those people? No, but I feel better. I talked to my janitor. Amazing. Nice work talking to your janitor. What do you need to do to create that tangible result? And the awkward slash beautiful thing about a tangible result is that 
whatever you have to do to make that happen, you're going to come into direct confrontation with your resistance as you practice. I don't want to call people. I'm worried that people think I'm a loser and don't want to spend time at my party. Beautiful. Now we have something to coach you on, to support you to address that. And because that story is in the way of you taking the action that would generate the result you say you want in your life, we can work with that. And we can directly tell, is this work making a difference? Are you actually taking the action? Not yet. Okay, great. What do we need to move out of the way this time? So when we put ourselves on the hook with a declaration, with a date, with a what by when, when we're really willing to get like into the dirt, to get our feet on the ground, to put rubber to pavement and all these other metaphors that I could start bringing in here, that's when our life really starts to change. And that's when coaching really starts to take traction in our lives as opposed to entirely being based work, which tends to be more therapeutic in nature In therapy there's less of a focus on where you want to arrive at, what you want to get to. Hey, Maria, long time no see. And as a result, you can have a conversation with someone forever, and maybe you're moving towards it, but who knows? And coaching that doesn't put any attention on the facilitative world, the the tangible world, becomes very similar. The nice thing about those two, you know, being-based, entirely being-based, soul-line kind of conversations, or like entirely what we'd call maybe like a traditional therapeutic model is that because there's no tangible thing that you have to confront, they, they feel a lot safer. They're less confronting in general because you don't, you don't have to push into something you're not happy about. Okay. 10, 13, one last topic. Huh. Everyone is always doing good. Have you guys noticed this? Have you noticed Well, here's how I'll say it. Every couple of months, Bay and I are down at Rhythmia sitting in transformational work, working with the sacred teacher that is Mother Ayahuasca. One of the modalities I recommend for transformational work. The other modalities I recommend are transformational coaching, working with a coach that knows their their work and is getting supported by their own coach. Um, I think breath work and ongoing practice can be really potent in any kind of yogic practice. And yogic practice can be physical yoga or otherwise. So when I say yogic practice, I'm talking about a yoga that has asanas that move you into what might be confronting for you. So for some people, that really is like saying, sitting in a stretch for five minutes. That's confronting because they're like, I want to move. It's important. I'm a gazelle. And it's like, great, look at that. The asana is bringing you into a moment of confrontation with yourself. There's an opportunity for you to move through something here. For Bay and I, our yogic practice is primarily sexual yoga. It's creating intimacy with another. How patient can I be with my partner as she opens slowly into the space I'm holding? And then you better believe I'm like, hurry the fuck up. Open. We're here for something. It doesn't work. That would be like shouting at your partner's penis or her yoni, like, get hard, get wet. That's not how these things work, right? That's not where the sexual occasion is created from. So it's the beautiful thing about a yogic practice is it moves you into something and really transformational coaching and plant medicine work. They're yogic in their nature. They support you into confronting the thing now, doing it now in this moment. Anyhow, I notice I go down to these ceremonies and I sit with maybe a hundred people and we create really profound relationships in the moment. What's happening is you're, you're being with a hundred people over the course of a week. And over the course of that week, The medicine supports us to come into harmony with ourselves, with the spiritual world, with nature, and with each other. And what that allows is for our nervous systems to settle. It allows our ego, our survival mechanism, to drop. It allows us to put down our armor and to just be like, oh, I don't have to pretend I'm anyone that I'm not with you. And you don't have to pretend you're anyone that you're not with me. And when we are brought into that moment, We have this profound human experience, the experience of being seen by another human being and seeing another human being. That sounds trite if you let it because we're not aware of how rarely that happens. We're like, oh yeah, I go out and I walk from here to the store and I see 20 people. That's, I love it. That's a really powerful experience for me, Adam. That's not what I'm talking about. Because as you're walking from here to the store, you're engaged with your armor. You're engaged with your survival mechanism and you're unaware of it. 
and all of the people you walk by are doing the exact same thing. You are seeing them as the filter they're projecting into the world and through the filter you project into the world. So if this and this, if these are like two people, we project an armor or a filter here. And so we see people with like that level of, I don't know, missing depth on one side and that level of missing depth on that side. So it's like we're seeing each other through a tremendous fog, our own projected fog and their projected fog. When you sit with plant medicine or when you sit in a truly transformational space led by a leader or a coach that's deep in their work, you are given the gift, the experience of seeing people with that fog burnt away. And that in itself is unbelievable. It's a deeply like transformational experience, deeply spiritual, and it leaves you with your heart just feeling blown wide open. So we do this and then we go back to our lives at the end of this week. Hey, Mia, nice to see you. We finished this week of deep work. We've had these incredible potent experiences and then we go back home and we meet our lives the way we left our lives. And what happens is we kind of like, we do a bit of negotiating with our lives energetically and our lives start to move a little bit around our new shape and we start to get pushed back into the old shape of our lives. So we kind of, we don't stay exactly the way we were when we left. We come back and okay, here's where I'm at. Maria, I'd love to hear more about what Maria is sharing. I need to make a drastic change in all areas. As a coach, it's confronting to realize this. I'd love to hear anything you'd like to share, Maria, about that. Or if you want to message me privately, I'd just love to hear about that. So we come back from this experience. We re-engage with our lives. We negotiate energetically with our lives. And then usually we check in with each other, tend, tend to after like a month or so. How are you doing? What's going on? What I notice is that notwithstanding the profound experience we had, anytime I check in with someone, they're great. They're doing good, <clears throat> which is nice. It's nice that they're doing good. But what I mean is, and you've probably noticed this everywhere, hey, how's it going? How is integration going for you? Here's some of the stuff I'm noticing. What are you noticing? I'm doing good is the answer I get. I notice this as our default as humans. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Also good. Okay, let's talk about anything else. And so the thing here is that that's our, that's our context. That's our default for engaging with one another. I'm good. You're good. Great. Should we talk about something? Yeah, there's nothing to talk about. All right. Well, nice time. Nice chatting with you. If we want to invite someone to a deeper level of conversation, we've got to be the ones to go. And I notice this every time because I'm always hoping someone's going to share something deeper with me. Oh, wow, this happened, that happened. But they rarely, if ever, do. And the reason is because i got to model it. I've got to go first. I've got to model being willing to put some intimacy on the table. And so that's our job. If we want more depth from people, we have to be willing to put more depth into the space. If you don't like small talk and you want more um, like depth, Consider that that's on you. What most people think when they hear that is, oh, God, I got to ask questions that invite this person to go deeper. No, you got to be willing to reveal more of yourself. Asking questions, inviting someone to go deeper. This is how small talk gets created is because, <clears throat> trust me, I created a fuck ton of small talk. <laughs> is We're like, I want depth from this conversation. And then we try to pull it out of that person over there with our questions. Tell me more about this. Tell me more about that. That's not how it works. What you're actually modeling in that, in that situation is you being safe and buttoned up and nice and closed and then asking questions, asking that person across from you to reveal more and more of the, themselves and to let go of their armor. Hey, Karen. Karen calls this the vulnerability dance. I love it. That's a great name for it. You can almost think of it like an armor dance in a way. So... If you find yourself in a, an experience where you're like, oh, this person is staying so tight and shallow, they're not going deep with me, consider that's a mirror for you. Consider that's your job. Show them what it looks like. Don't ask questions to make them become more vulnerable. Show them what it looks like to be more vulnerable. So if you're, you know, I, I remember being at a networking event once and I ran into someone, I, I, I met someone. I was like, hey, how's it going? And they were very like, um, good. Yep. Fine. Good. Yep. They, they were very, um, I think the term would be like, uh, affable. 
like their energy was like everything's fine and oh it's nice to meet you you know you just had a phoniness to it a little bit not that they were phony as a human but like in that moment they were trying to be a certain way that didn't ring true to them and i was like oh i, I really want to know how things are going actually going for this person i'm just going to share and so i told them they were like how about you and i was like yeah you know i'm a little nervous i feel a bit awkward here I, i'm never super comfortable in these um in these situations, but you know, it's fine. It's all good. I don't really mind it too much, but yeah, that's, that's what's going on for me. And, and the, the person, so, you know, I was intending to model, like, I'm just going to share what's actually up for me. And the person went, uh, Oh, it's going to be okay. Don't you worry. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm okay with how I am. So what was happening there was I was okay with how I was, but he wasn't. He needed to console me or comfort me because his story about how I was feeling was that there's something wrong with it. So as you practice going first, as you practice modeling something like this, you will be met with this sort of thing. And what's important to recognize about this is that what you are getting met with is the reason that the person across from you is keeping the conversation shallow. That's, and so you have to, again, model something, which is when someone responds to you in such a way that is like consoling you or like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Then it becomes your job to model. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm totally fine with how I am. I'm just sharing that that's there. And what we're doing then is we're modeling um, some vulnerability, some intimacy. We're giving them complete opportunity to, to be however they want to be about it. And then uh, letting that be perfect just as it is and allowing ourselves to be comfortable exactly where we are. And as we do that sort of stuff, it creates something magical in the space because the person across from you starts to be curious and notice like, huh, this is, that was weird. Like I told them it was okay, but they didn't seem to need that. Not, didn't seem to need that in like that brusque way where we're like, yeah, fuck off, I'm fine. You know that one when people try to make us feel okay and we're like, get off of me. Instead, we welcome what they brought with love, but we're also really sovereign about it. We're like, yeah, no, I know. I'm totally comfortable being, feeling awkward, just sharing it. Anyhow, anything else you want to share or, you know, whatever. So that's our job. Anytime we have a criticism about how that person over there is showing up, the opportunity as leader, be really clear, the opportunity as leader. So the opportunity as opposed to the thing you have to do. It's the opportunity for you in that moment. And as leader, it's not something that's an opportunity from any other place. It's if I'm committed to being an op a leader, here's my opportunity. The opportunity as leader is to take whatever we are frustrated with over there and let that be a guide in terms of what is called for for me to bring into the space. A uh, person's being like buttoned up, as Cammy put it. They're not showing themselves. Okay, great. How can I show a little bit more of myself? How can I model this for them? The person across the table is not taking any responsibility for what's going on. Okay, great. How can I model taking responsibility, even though I'm worried that they'll use it against me? Well, guess what? That's probably why that person across the table from you is not taking responsibility. They're worried you're going to use it against them. So now you get to model what it is to take responsibility, even though there's a risk it may be used against you. So this is what we do. As leaders, we, we embrace this opportunity and we take this on and we lean forward. And as you start to do this, something really fun begins to happen, which is you become a giant weirdo that like starts having a lot of fun at networking events. And the reason is because you stop trying to play some complicated game of chess and professionalism and showing up the right way. And you start to simply allow yourself to show up however you are. And it does a few things. One, it frees you. Two, it confuses the hell out of the people that are at that networking event because you're no longer playing by these scripted rules that aren't that much fun to play anyhow. And three, it creates you as an invitation to other people. They start to be like, they start to have fun with you and you start to draw people to you because that's more fun. I, I was at a networking event <laughs> where I went up to some someone and I was like, I can't remember exactly what I said, but something like, greetings, let's begin networking. And then really laid into that, that idea of just like, how do you like my networking currently? What more should we do to network? And we had a blast together. We ended up spending the rest of the night hanging out, just being idiots. I had way more fun at that event 
And I built much more relationship with that person than I would have if I like put on the veneer and shook his hand and gave him my business card for him to throw out at the end of the night and all of that sort of stuff. So this is the opportunity that's always available for us is we don't have to play the game that's being played. We can play the game of authenticity. We can play the game of having fun. We can play the game of sharing truth and letting the world respond to that truth however it wants to respond. And we can play the game of not making it meaningful However, the world responds to our truth because we know what our truth is, that we're okay with what's showing up for us. Okay. Uh, here, one more time. Hmm. Karen says, I love the freedom of showing up how I am, raising my hand. People are so thirsty for real. They really are. And when we have the courage to show up as truth, as real, as authenticity, or as authentic as we can be in the moment, because that's really the only bar we can aim for. And the way we do that is we be authentic about where we're being inauthentic. That's, that's the path towards greater authenticity. When we do that, we become very magnetic. We don't have to market ourselves. We don't have to fool people. We don't have to like pretend that we don't feel the way that we do. We just have to be willing to like show up in our truth. We have to be willing to let the world respond to that however it chooses to. And we have to be willing to like come back to loving ourselves no matter what is, is coming. And as we do that, it, it creates just this incredibly magnetic aura around us because people are like, that's what people want. It's what we all want is the freedom of being expressed as ourselves. So practice that and notice the impact. All right, in a half hour, I'm gonna lead along with my friend Rodney and my friend Lisa, I'm gonna lead a conversation on um, Creating clients, this is specifically for coaches. If you're curious, you can go to Lisa's, uh, what does she call the group? Coaches, creating, calm, and then she's community. Community is emphasized. So head over to that group. We're gonna start in a half hour. I'm gonna jump on the call there a little bit early to get our ducks in a row. But um, if you've not heard me talk before about client creation, you should, because it's awesome. And if you've never heard Rodney or Lisa talk about it, you're in for a treat. They're fantastic. I love partnering with these two. And, um, and we're just gonna have a bunch of fun. So that'll go from 11 to 1230 PST. I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. If I don't see you there, thanks for hanging out. You're all awesome. Peace. We'll talk soon.